Hi, this is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial, bringing you more useful landscape tips to help improve our environment. Today, I'm interviewing Dan Gibson. Now, Dan is a second year master's student at Michigan State University. He's going for his master's in science and entomology. And Dan is part of the Landis Lab, um, which um, has a really interesting focus these days on beneficial insects. So, we're going to be talking a little bit about those creatures. Welcome, Dan. Hi, Kim. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And I guess the first obvious question, Dan, is, um, gosh, what is, what's a beneficial insect? So a beneficial insect is any sort of insect that helps us humans out in some way. Uh, the most common beneficial insects are pollinators and natural enemies. Okay. And you're, you're focused on natural enemies, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So what are some of the categories of natural enemies? So there are two general broad categories of natural enemies, predators and parasitoids. So predators will actively eat their prey, whether by sucking out juices from it or by chewing it up, whereas parasitoids will lay an egg in a host and consume it that way. Okay. And they're decomposers too, right? Mm-hmm. And t talk a little bit about how they work. Decomposers? Mm-hmm. Right, so it, a decomposer will find uh, dead material, whether plant material or uh, dead and decaying insect material in the ground, and eat that and break it down and renew those nutrients to go back into the soil. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I know a lot of folks um, in the gardening and landscaping world uh, will be familiar with some of these um, beneficials, some of these natural enemies. Um, let's talk about one that um, people love. It's kind of the poster child for beneficials. Um, ladybugs. Tell us a little bit about them and their biology. All right. So like you said, ladybugs are the most well-known insect. We think of a ladybug chowing down an aphid on a plant. And they are, in fact, very, very good at that. <laughs> so both as the larvae and the adult, uh, ladybugs consume aphids and lots of other small, soft-bodied insects like scale insects or young leafhoppers, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, from what I understand, in their larval stage, they're really um, terrific. Uh, they're voracious with uh, aphids. Is that right? Even yes. more so than as adults. Yes, they absolutely are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one study I know of um, looking at the multicolored Asian ladybird beetle mm -hmm. uh, where it was measured to consume over 100 aphids in a single day. Every day. That's that's kind of disappointing because we all want to hate the uh, <laughs> the Asian lady beetles, the ones that come into right. our homes, and um, the, you know that's kind of a clue if they're in your house, they're not a native. So right. um, it's it's reassuring they provide some sort of service. But um, um, talk a little bit about our um, our native uh, lady beetles, if you wouldn't mind, some of the species and what they might specialize in. So one of the more common native species is the pink ladybug, or mm -hmm. lady beetle, uh, which is somewhat more long and narrow than the multicolored Asian ladybird beetle, which we've probably all seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and as its name implies, it's pink. And that one is very similar. It consumes a lot of aphids and other soft-bodied insects, but it also tends to consume a lot of pollen. Mm -hmm. uh, especially you'll find it in cornfields where it's feeding largely on pollen as well as the pest insects on the plant. Okay. And um, I'll be speaking with um, with uh, your professor, um, Doug Landis, later in another podcast, but I know you all are doing uh, some really interesting research at Michigan State on uh, native plants and uh, beneficial insects and which ones are most attractive. Just tell us a little bit about that, that research. All right. So this research that I'm doing now is... Uh, a second piece of some research that was done earlier. The idea of it is to determine what local native species attract these beneficial insects, natural enemies in this case, and provide them with the nectar and pollen resources they need. Mm -hmm. So although these natural enemies may feed primarily on pest insects, they also need pollen and nectar to either complete their life cycle or sustain them when um, prey or hosts are in short supply. Okay. And so we can assist these insects by providing these resources on the landscape. So we can plant strips. If we're in an agricultural setting, we can plant strips of these native wildflowers to support the populations of the beneficial insects. Or in a um, 
gardening setting, we can intentionally put these plants mm -hmm. in our landscape. So my work is looking at a bunch of different perennials. I have 55 or so in the list that we planted in all these independent plots. And we go and measure them throughout the year, throughout the blooming season, and vacuum insects off of them to see which natural enemies, which pollinators, which herbivores we find in those plants. Ultimately, to take that list of 55 and bring it down to the top 10, 15, 20 that are highly attractive to natural enemies and mm -hmm. would provide good resources if you're trying to supplement on them on the landscape. And I would assume that um, different native plant species are going to often, um, oftentimes attract different uh, beneficials um, because of body size or mouth size. Have you found mm -hmm. that to be so? I certainly have. So you get a lot of variety of flower types. So for instance, yarrow is, um, which is probably familiar to all of us, mm -hmm. wide, flat inflorescence, inflorescences with very shallow flowers. And so in that plant, the nectar is highly available on a very short corolla. So it's very easy mm -hmm. to get to. Mm -hmm. And so you find a lot of very small insects and a variety of big insects on that because the nectar is available to a wide variety of insects. Whereas some other flowers, like penstemon, for instance, right. the nectar is buried all the way down that big, long corolla, and you're probably not going to see a large fly, for instance, feeding on that. Mm -hmm. You'll see a lot of bumblebees pushing their way in, but it's not accessible to other types of insects. So because of that, you get a variety of in the communities between each plant mm -hmm. species. So those those open, kind of large, umbiliferous type of flowers, I would think, would attract perhaps the most numerous um, number of species, um, and um, yarrow being an example of that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, tell us a little bit about um, some other uh, natural enemies that are predators. Right, so while we're talking about beetles, there are a few other interesting ones to mention. So one is the soldier beetle, mm -hmm. which is so named because it really looks like it's wearing a brightly colored orange uniform. Uh, it's a cousin of the uh, firefly family, so it has kind of a similar rectangular long shape without the light-producing organs that the firefly has. Um, it's bright orange with black spots in the back that are either toward the a big black spot toward the back or almost covering the entire wing cover. Um, and these we often see toward the end of the season, especially on a plant like goldenrod, mm -hmm. where at the end of the season, we'll start seeing hundreds upon hundreds of these coalescing on top of these goldenrod flowers. And it might be worrisome at first because you think, oh gosh, there are so many of these. Are they eating my plant? Mm-hmm. And in fact, they're not. They are actually predators, um, both in their larval stage, where they're in the um, in the soil, where they eat a variety of small soil-dwelling invertebrates, and then as adults, they move up into the plants where they feed on other small, soft-bodied insects. Mm -hmm. I think you make a very good point, too. Oftentimes people panic if they see um, this plethora of insects <laughs> on a flower. And most of the times we ought to be rejoicing because it means we've got a better natural balance in our landscapes. And probably the vast majority of those insects are going to be beneficial or benign. So thank you for making that right. point. Um, and um, <clears throat> so the soldier beetles um, are one example of a predator. Give us, give us some other examples. All right, so there, while we're on beetles, there are a couple other beetles that are fairly common that are ground-dwelling. Um, mm -hmm. The rove beetles and the ground beetles. Rove and ground, okay. Yep, so the rove beetles are quite distinctive. They're long, slender beetles, and the wing covers, so the hard part over the back, are very short. They only cover about a third of the length of the abdomen rather than the full length that most beetles have. Uh, so they're very distinctive if you see them, and they and the ground beetles both run along the ground and feed on whatever they can grab on the ground. They're both quite voracious predators and capable of eating rather hard insects. So their diets are pretty diverse. Dan, this brings up an interesting question about how uh, predators actually eat their prey. So they, they have different mouth parts and they have a different way of consuming their prey. Can you, can you describe some of those uh, different uh, types? Yeah, so 
we've been talking about beetles, and all of them use chewing mouth parts. So they have jaws and mandibles that move and crush and break up whatever their prey is. So they eat it in a pretty conventional way, like we would. Uh, some other groups, like the true bugs, have what we call a beak. It's essentially a very strong, short or long uh, mouth part that they pierce the in their prey insect with and inject saliva that digests the inside of the insect, and then they suck that fluid back up. And then they'll leave the dried husk of an insect after they're done feeding on it. I, I love that that whole picture. <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite um, beneficials would be the wheel bug. It has that yes. kind of action, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that uh, that's really cool. <laughs> now the uh, the other category that we've talked about, the parasitoids, they have a different mechanism for um, uh, accessing food. How does that work? Right. So parasitoids, rather than actively um, seeking out and chewing or sucking on their prey as adults, will lay an egg on or inside a host insect. So that might be an egg that they parasitize or a larvae or nymph or even an adult. And what happens is that egg will hatch and the larvae will begin to eat that host insect as it continues to live. And it will continue to eat and molt and go through its lifespan without killing that host until ultimately the larvae of the parasitoid matures, kills its host from the inside out after having eaten most of its internal tissues, then it pupates and will then emerge from the carcass or what's called a mummy of the host insect. That's a pretty miserable <laughs> experience for the prey, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> to think that that host or prey item is eating and eating, trying uh. to provide resources for itself, when in reality all of that food is going straight to the parasitoid. Wow. What are some examples of parasitoids? So there are two major groups of parasitoids. There are a variety of parasitoid wasps and also a group of parasitoid flies. Okay. What are some of the wasps that we might be familiar with? So there are kind of three main taxa or groups of parasitoid wasps. These are the Braconid wasps, the Ichneumonid wasps, and the Chalcidoid wasps. I know the names are fairly long. There are no common names for these. <laughs> makes so it easier. Those, yep. So those are the, family, the scientific family names of those species. So the Braconids and the Ichneumonids can range a lot in size. Most of them are very small on the scale of a few millimeters, but they can range to being even five centimeters long or so. There are several very large ichneumonid wasps that have these long, slender ovipositors or egg-laying devices that they will use to parasitize wood-burrowing beetle larvae. They'll guide these long, slender ovipositors, which may be two centimeters long, into a burrow in an old tree and find the larvae in there and sting it and lay an egg inside it. Now, when people hear the word wasp, they immediately tend to go to uh, those that are um, colonizers and live in groups in these <laughs> nests. But these are completely different types of wasps, aren't they? Right. Completely different. These will never bother to sting you. They don't live in colonies, so they aren't going to nest under your deck and threaten the safety of you or your sugary drinks. Uh, so in general, they are very helpful to us and not a nuisance at all. Mm -hmm. And underappreciated. <laughs> and, and very underappreciated, largely because they're so small. Mm -hmm. So like I said, most of the Braconids and the Ichneumonids are very, very small. And they feed on mostly larvae or adults of other insects. The Chalcidoid wasps are mostly egg predators, which means if they're feeding on insect eggs, they must be very, very small. Mm -hmm. So these are generally dark, shiny wasps that you can barely see with your naked eye. Mm -hmm. If you put them up next to a ladybug under a microscope, they are still tiny in comparison to that giant ladybug. Okay. And so because they're so small, we don't know they're there. Mm -hmm. So they might be present by the thousands in our garden, but we never know we're there. They're there. And so we never appreciate them because mm -hmm. they're so small. And the third category that you mentioned... The third category I mentioned were 
the parasitoid flies. Mm -hmm. This is in the family Tachinidae. Mm -hmm. And so these flies are fairly similar in size to a house fly, kind of a similar size and shape. Uh, but they're very hairy. They have these long, stiff hairs on the back and generally some gray stripes on the body. Okay. And this is a very diverse family that parasitizes many, many different groups of insects. Beetles, moths, butterflies, true bugs, um, other flies. Um, so many different groups. And these are interesting in that they actually have some crazy ways of getting the larvae into the host. So the wasp parasit parasitoids will generally directly pierce the host. They'll inject that egg straight into it. Mm -hmm. Some tachinid flies do that. Others, however, have some other creative ways to do it, like gluing the egg onto the back of the host. And then once, then once the larvae hatches, it burrows its own way in, mm -hmm. which you can imagine probably doesn't feel too great. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some others that have a method that I think is very cool where they'll lay the egg on the plant or the leaf that is eaten by whatever host insect. Mm -hmm. So they'll lay it on the plant host of the insect host. Mm -hmm. And so those larvae hatch are very small and crawling around the plant, and some hapless host eating the leaf will accidentally ingest the larva. Wow. And then that larva is inside the stomach, and from there it can start eating that insect. Mm -hmm. This raises a really interesting point, Dan, in that, um, you know, these predators and parasitoids may actually not just be focused on insects that we don't want in our landscapes. Um, this idea of beneficial is, is kind of um, a term that we use, um, and we you know, we make a, a judgment about whether an insect's good or bad. But, um, you know, there are a lot of, of insects that uh, that will be utilized by these beneficials that we actually value in our garden, aren't there? Right. There definitely are. So, for instance, if you think about the wheel bug you mentioned, which is mm -hmm. a type of assassin bug, that bug might be eating pest insects that we don't want around, but it might also snag a hapless honeybee that happens mm -hmm. to visit the flower that it's next to. And so we don't really want it to do that. But really, when we think about the picture of the whole community and the whole ecosystem, they're still playing a valuable role. They're keeping everything in balance. And so consuming what we would call other beneficial insects is part of the game. And it's right. still providing us really more of a benefit because it keeps the communities more stable. Well, it's a big food web, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, Dan, uh, one of my favorite insects, one of my hero insects is the cicada killer wasp. And um, I've witnessed quite an interesting uh, scene watching one of these things uh, basically paralyze a, a, a cicada and drag it up a tree. How, how, how do they function? So, frankly, I am amazed at the capabilities of these wasps. They are absolutely huge. And the fact that they can still manage to fly while carrying a full-size cicada is astounding. But what they do is, when they sting the cicada, they paralyze it, so it can't fly anymore. And then they will go store it somewhere and lay an egg next to it. And the cicada will not die, it will continue to be paralyzed until that egg hatches. And then that larva will continue to eat the cicada, much like a parasitoid, until it's ready to pupate and then emerge as an adult wasp. Mm -hmm. And so that wasp will lay individual uh, burrows with a cicada and an egg. And that egg has all the res resources it needs from that one cicada. And that wasp will do that many times, each time with a new egg. Now, I may be wasp obsessed today, but let's, I'm going to ask you a question about another another function that wasps perform. So we've been talking with this kid, a killer wasp uh, about a parasitoid, but um, wasps can be quite good predators too, can't they? Yes, they definitely can. What are, so, what are some wasps that we might see in our gardens that are predators, and how do they function? So many common wasps that we'll see in our gardens include yellow jackets and other paper wasps. These we tend to not like as much because they definitely can sting you if they're feeling that they need to defend themselves or their colony. And these will actively seize their 
prey and chew it, much like a beetle would. Mm -hmm. And they might either eat it on site or bring it back to the colony where they will feed it to their sisters or to the larva mm -hmm. in that colony. From what I understand, they actually will chew up um, chew up the, the protein, the uh, target insect, and feed it to their young and probably get a few nice tasty bites themselves while doing so. Yep. Uh, what are some other predators that that, uh, that you're studying? So there are a couple other really cool predators. I think one of my favorites is the green lacewing. Well, lacewings in general, but the green lacewing is the more common one. Mm -hmm. So you've probably seen these either in your garden or flying around a light at night. They're very dainty looking slender insects, bright green with a long slender body, about a centimeter long and these big, round, lacy, clear wings that they fold over themselves like a tent. And as an adult, they can be a variety of things. Some of them are predators. Others feed only on pollen and nectar, uh, whereas the larvae of all species are voracious predators. Uh, they eat so much and so fast that they've gotten the term aphid lion. Hmm. So they look somewhat like a lady beetle larva and I think the best comparison for what they look like is a miniature alligator kind of long and slender with pretty pronounced body segments and these big legs and mandibles and it looks like if you, if you squint a little bit like a very small alligator mm -hmm. and as ferocious as one what are some of the other predators that you're studying Dan all right so another really common one is the minute pirate bug which, first off, that's a fantastic name for an insect. <laughs> um, but they're called that because, first of all, they are minute, only a few millimeter, millimeters long. If you look at it on a leaf, it's just a little black speck. Um, but they're called pirate bugs because they're also voracious predators. They're bugs, so they have a piercing beak, which they'll pierce the skin of the prey with and suck out its juices. Um, and it's like piracy of the insects on the plant. Uh, but they're very small, about five millimeters or less long, and they're mostly black with some white markings on them if you look closely. Um, and they will feed on quite a variety of small, soft-bodied insects and mites, and even insect eggs. Mm -hmm. So small aphids, um, a variety of pest eggs, spider mites. Um, if you're in agriculture, corn earworm eggs are a common prey item as well as young leafhoppers and even caterpillars. Um, generally, they're there all season long, but we don't notice them because they're so small. But toward the end of the summer, we start noticing them because they migrate from different habitats. And so as they're flying around, they might encounter a human, and they'll sometimes inflict a pretty painful bite accidentally mm. landing on us, which it's an surprisingly painful bite in consideration of how tiny the insect is. Mm -hmm. It'll never hurt you and it doesn't happen often, but that's some people's only exposure to them. It's this tiny little black insect that somehow <laughs> managed to bite them. Gosh. But in general, they're a very helpful, uh, predaceous insect. Mm -hmm. any, any other favorite predators? So another favorite of mine is the damsel bug. So this is another insect that is named so because it's long and slender, but it's fairly small, probably less than a centimeter long, and mostly brown with pretty long legs. It's another bug, so it feeds by uh, piercing an insect with its beak and sucking out the juices. And it also feeds on a variety of soft-bodied insects. Mm -hmm. A lot of aphids, a lot of eggs, caterpillars, mites, and nymphs and larvae of other insects like tarnished plant bug pests, or asparagus beetles, Colorado potato beetles, a variety of other things. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds like there are just tons of these beneficials that we can plant to attract and support. Um, and part of this equation is habitat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is the different requirements for habitat. Can you speak a little bit about that? So yeah, so these insects require a number of different things. Uh, the first is additional food. So while we consider them beneficial insects because they eat the pest species on our ornamental plants in our garden or in our crops and agricultural fields, uh, they need food even when the pests of whatever plant you care about are not in season. 
And so they need alternative prey or alternative hosts to the pest, which means they need a diversity of plants on the landscape where they can forage and get those other types of insects because the different types of plants will host different types of insects, giving the beneficial natural enemies a variety to choose from. And so in different times of the year, they'll be feeding on different insects in different places, potentially. Mm -hmm. The other thing that they'll need is supplemental pollen and nectar. So although a lot of these predators are primarily carnivorous, they also will supplement their diet with protein from pollen or carbohydrates, sugar, from nectar. In some cases, this is a regular supplement of their diet. In other cases, it is their alternative food when prey is scarce. So a minute pirate bug or a pink lady beetle, those are two that commonly come to mind, will readily feed on pollen for their protein in absence of protein from prey insects. Mm -hmm. And so having those floral resources around in the landscape can allow the populations of those beneficial natural enemies to persist mm -hmm. even when the pest prey that we are interested in controlling isn't around. And in terms of, of where these things um, seek refuge, um, nesting areas, etc., I mean, there are a lot of different uh, types of insects that are ground dwellers or ones that like the forest edge or meadows and grasses. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, also kind of speaks to um, leaving um, perhaps a little untidiness um, or uh, appreciating the fact that, um, you know, maybe there's a particular beneficial that likes to be under a log or a stone or whatever, right? And having a diversity mm -hmm. of habitat. Yep, I think you just hit on it very well, that there are a variety of requirements needed for the many different types of insects. A lot of them nest or will overwinter in stems, in the soil, underground, um, in rock piles or brush piles. And so providing those habitats on the landscape, rather than cleaning everything, mm -hmm. can be very useful to them. So in a gardening context, maybe leave a corner of your garden somewhere that's a little more wild. Mm -hmm. Let some weeds mm -hmm. grow in it. Let the mulch build up um, and leave that there. In an um, agricultural context, this is not tilling up every bit of land every year. Mm -hmm. Providing kind of weedy, or in this case, uh, flower-rich borders in which these insects can have a safe place to overwinter that isn't going to be tilled up before they emerge right. in the spring. And I think um, as residential um, homeowners do more meadowscaping, leaving maybe half or a third or whatever of your meadow untouched each year is a, is a really good way to preserve some habitat. It's kind of going, going along the lines of what you discussed with agriculture. All right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So where is, where is your research taking you next? What can we look forward to seeing from uh, Michigan State on uh, this topic? So this research is still underway, so we're in our second year of sampling for this particular project, um, and we'll be seeing results from it starting the end of this year and into next year. And so this stage is kind of a preliminary stage of looking at what species are best, what plant species should we use for this task. The next thing, or the next step in the process is determining how to go about doing this. So if we know generally that yarrow and pale-leafed sunflower and slender mountain mint are good for attracting, say, a group of parasitoid wasps, that's a useful piece of information, but it's not very specific. So the next stage is to think more specifically about how do we establish these different types of plants um, in an agricultural setting, which is where MSU focuses most of its work. So how do we establish them on the landscape effectively and cost-effectively? And how do we tailor it to control specific pests? Mm -hmm. Which can absolutely be tr true in a gardening context as well as a agricultural context. So what group of plant species attract the insects that will be controlling uh, Colorado potato beetle in mm -hmm. potatoes or asparagus beetle in asparagus without bringing in additional herbivores that will then feed on that crop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, 
I'd like to underscore the point of it, of planting to attract. Um, we're not talking about purchasing imported beneficial insects from somewhere else that might be introducing um, other pests and diseases. Right. So that's where, again, the term natural enemies comes in. It implies that they're enemies that are naturally occurring in the landscape. And so as we create supplemental habitat for these enemies, we're not aiming to introduce them in the form of classical biological control, but rather to merely enhance the populations that are already on the landscape mm -hmm. and bring them where we want them. Gotcha. Well, this is terrific work, and I really appreciate you uh, talking with me today, Dan, about this important topic, uh, something very, uh, very key to, um, to gardening and landscaping more environmentally. So thank you so much, and I look forward to your coming research results. All right. Thank you very much, Kim. This is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial. Thanks for watching. For more useful tips, please visit www.ecobeneficial.com. <music>